Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Reality Decoded. This one is going to be about life after death. I have been asked so many times to do this, I just absolutely had to bump this one up the list. So if you're new here to the channel, leave a sub on the channel. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get into the episode. Thanks. Deepak, how do you look at death from the standpoint of consciousness? I look at death as creativity. So every creative process has a death involved. In biology, we call it apoptosis, programmed cellular death. Your skin cells have to die once a month. Your stomach cells die every five days. Your immune cells die, uh, like your blood cells, every 120 days or so but they remember how to attack the bacterium. And in fact, every immune cell looks at a pathogen and says, have I had this an experience with, with this guy before? Uh, I haven't, but what did my grandfather think of him? Okay, because the memory of the previous cell is recycled in the memory of the new cell. DNA is the repository of the memory of evolution, but its actual stuff comes and goes every six weeks. So what recycles is a matrix of memory which I, through my deep understanding of consciousness, is not in the brain or not in your body. It's non-local, it's in consciousness, which has no location, space and time. So we are recycling of consciousness. If we can understand that, then death and resurrection in the literal sense is creativity. It's creating new contexts, new meanings, new relationships, all the time, I'm hesitating to use the word reincarnation because you get lost in religious ideology, but there's no question that everything in the universe recycles, everything. I appreciate the poetry of recycling, but it doesn't do very much for me. As long as you think of yourself as this little skin encapsulated ego dragging around a bag of flesh and bones, yes, yeah, it does. But I have a certain sense of my own personal consciousness, I'm my own personal awareness, and I like that. Are you going to take that away from me in some cosmic consciousness after death or recycle me? Because I don't remember any other cycles, and so those other cycles that I were do me no good. Okay, Robert. You want the truth with a capital T. I do. Okay? That's why I come to what you. What did you have for lunch three weeks ago on Thursday? Okay, I don't remember. But the fact is there are lots of things we've experienced that we don't remember. Of course. Right? Sure. So just because you don't remember being Cleopatra in a previous lifetime doesn't exclude the possibility. All right, look. Okay? I, I or uh, being a housemaid or whatever. Right, okay. right. The question is, what is our real identity? I agree. Okay? Once you find out that your real identity is way beyond anything in space-time, then there is no birth and there is no death. There is only the continuum of birth and death as punctuated points in the grammar of life. Does that mean I have to give up my personal sense of, of, of awareness? You have to expand your personal sense. There's nothing to give up. You can only give up what existed, okay? But if you expand your sense of awareness till you realize you're all of this and you feel it, then there is nothing to give up. You are the universe in this little impermanent life form. Will I know it's me? If you can awaken yourself into the awareness of your bigger identity now, mm. you will never fear death because you will know that that is who you really are. But that's a different sense than I have today. It's a, it's a sense that I don't exist. It's a sense that I've blended into a cosmic consciousness. No, you don't. I'm you not sure that's if, worth it. If you can witness... I'm not sure I want that. Okay, listen. Why do I want that? In any given day. It's like disappearing. In any given day. I don't want to disappear. Listen to me. As long as you don't confuse yourself with the role you're playing right now as Robert, you're free. If you get attached to the role, then you're in the melodrama of fear and existence, which everybody is going through their existential crisis. You're like a guy in a movie theater who has forgotten that they're watching a movie. 
Okay, you are the witness of the movie. It's your destiny to play an infinity of roles, but you're not the roles you play. You're the eternal witness in which the roles come and go. And you better get hold of that internal witness because it's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Mm. That is so profound. We are destined to play an infinite amount of roles whilst simultaneously not being the roles that we play. I can absolutely see why this would be confusing to so many people to try and understand. But in the mighty words of Bob Marley, what is easy is not worth it, and what's worth it is not going to be easy. So you got to pick your battles, right? I love what Deepak Chopra said about getting a hold of your life, though. I feel like we've talked about this on the channel a whole bunch, about how you are the orderly and the quartermaster and everything about your own life, okay? Nobody's going to do the things for you. You've got to be willing and able to do them. Elon Musk said, if nobody were to produce things, there would be nothing to consume. So you either have to choose between becoming a creator or becoming a consumer. There is no uh, one or the other. You got to choose, okay? Got to choose. In this video, Deepak Chopra talked about a sense of the I and the me and the we and the us. And uh, I wanted to touch on that as well, about how the ego is this entity or mindset that has been created for us that makes us think that we're actually separate from everything around us. There is no I, okay? It's the us, it's the eternal we. And that's what Deepak Chopra is talking about here, is once you get down to the core fundamental concept that you understand that there is no I, there is no separation from us in the earth and us in the universe, we are the stardust we are the light compressed on the flat disk of the hard drive that is the human body okay and if we had our full potential we'd be able to conquer the universe that's why we had to have been hindered um to get where we're going okay and that's why even we were gifted the curse to die death is a new adventure it is a redo it's a re-rolling of the dice according to a lot of rpgs a lot of meditation teaches about how um, meditation itself is actually the practice of accepting death. That way, whenever it comes time for your earthly body to die, you are not cursing it going, ah, I wish I would have done more because you have taken the time to realize and accept where you are, where you want to go, put your thoughts on paper, because a man and a woman, they are their dreams and visions, not their education, not their circle of friends, not, not any of that. It is your dreams and visions. And what's amazing about that is Deepak talks about how those dreams and visions and genetic lessons are passed on to us, the next generation, from our predecessors in the form of light DNA genetic information. It's like, well, I might not understand and might not have had a personal experience with this, but what did they feel? You know, that's called a preconceived notion. And that's why as you grow up, it's actually important for you to create that individuation from what you were taught as a kid and expose the shadow and make it light, put that camera lens on it, which is your attention, and focus on it that way whenever you do die in this lifetime you have conquered as many life lessons as you absolutely had to that way in the next life you can go up the next karmic level to be able to experience the next higher vibrational wave of messages and blessings and lessons that's what this is all about life and death is the eternal recycling of the energy newton's laws of conservation of energy talk about how energy is neither recycled i'm sorry energy is neither destroyed nor created it is just infinitely recycled into the next thing the next evolution the next revision the next upgrade from what it was before that's why kids are oftentimes better than their parents unless you just have really terrible parents who like to keep you under thumb that happens you know but that's why that sense of individuation is the most one of the most important things a person can develop as moral character so let's go to this next video i love this one this one is about duncan trussell and he is talking to Joe Rogan about what he has learned about from Vedic texts. And I think he touches on Ram Dass and all that. So let's watch this one. Here we go. If anything, it's a dress rehearsal for death. I mean, you're going to, that's a, the thing is, is like that blink. If you're an atheist, which, you know, I, I, I get that. And I think there must be some like deep. Do you know any atheists that have done like a real blowout psychedelic session? No. I know a couple. 
And then those those are the most puzzling to me because the guy people have done like real blowout mushroom sessions or blowout DMT sessions. I always think that they would leave the door open to the impossible because it is impossible and you experienced it. It's not like even if you're imagining it, I couldn't imagine that. So how am I imagining that? How right. am I imagining something in such incredible, vivid color and, and detail and, sure. and knowledge and love and all these different things you experience in that state? That state is otherworldly. The fact that that is accessible at all, I don't care if it's through a molecule or through a, a, a yoga session. I don't care how it's accessible. Right. But the, the, the fact that that's accessible at all leaves open to me the I don't know, because I didn't know that that was a thing. So once I've experienced that, I'm like, oh, well, all this flat plane of existence that we take for granted, that we think this is this is everything around us, yeah. this is the whole environment we have to worry out for, this might be just one fucking stage on the radio dial of experiences right. and of, of dimensions that are interacting with us. We just don't have the senses to to tune into them. And when you can, for me at least, it leaves open the door for who the fuck knows? Who knows, man? I just the fact that that's a thing. To, there's a okay. So this is a trip. This this is very trippy. So I got this book called The Tibetan Yoga of Dream and Sleep. Whoa, I feel like I should like this. Yeah. It's fucking cool. But basically, it's like a, a form of Tibetan Buddhism uh, that invites you to explore the difference between when you think you're awake and when you're dreaming. And so basically, the idea is. There isn't much of a difference. There's like right now, you're dreaming. This thing you call your human incarnation is <laughs> like a, is a dream. Mm. And you know, like when people are dying, they get all delirious and shit. They slide through time. You know, like I don't know if you've ever been around a dying person, but they, they, they like suddenly they're back in Vietnam, they're in the 50s. Yeah. They're in the 30s, where, however, whatever their lifetime, which means that when you're dying, you're going to like spin through time too, meaning that this could be you dying right now, spinning backwards Jesus, through time, Duncan. but like in a dream. So that when you, you know, this is the, the main thing about it is that when we die, according to this, we, we sort of spend like 39 days, I think it is in a place called the Bardo, which is, um, uh, essentially like what it's like to have no body but still have this like i this basically like your karma your identity sort of propelling you through and that that that's how you like get your next incarnation so mm. essentially like that's the, the, what we're dealing with here is so bizarre and surreal that it easily could just be a dream state that one of these vast AIs that already exist is having. We're just processors. We're just being run. It's like running a simulation of a pandemic or, or maybe this is a way that like uh, an AI gets polished. Like maybe we're an AI that's being like polished and taught through this process of having a limited incarnation. You got to have that so that there's a reason for us to actually invest ourselves in stuff. Like if we were gods, if we lived for a million years, eventually we wouldn't have such a passionate relationship i think with the world the, anyone right. who's gonna so you need that to train the thing up so it takes it seriously you have to put the setting on mortal then you have, then maybe you just run a series of tests on the thing you know you start run to, what is this what have we made what does it do in a pandemic and by it i mean the sum total of all humans which is right now disconnected it's like a malfunctioning brain the you know what i mean we're not connecting mm. But if we were being like sort of, I don't know how you put it, groomed, evolved intentionally, then every single moment in an individual's life and in a planet, the planet's, the life of history could be looked at as a training or an upgrade. This could be an operating system upgrade. This could be what an operating system upgrade looks like in the biocomputer that we exist in. It looks like a fucking pandemic. And that's what's happening right now is we're being like upgraded for some reason, even though it's terrifying and uh, obviously horrific, you know, we're mm. being upgraded. And uh, when you anyway, the whole point is, man, this thing that we're in right now, whether or not there's a God, we just I think an atheist gets to lean into the idea that when they close their eyes and breathe their last breath, it stops. And I just think that's a big gamble, man. That's And I don't mean because you go to hell. I mean, 
how nice would that be yeah if it just stopped when more than likely it's you know the at least in this tibetan yoga of dreaming and sleep more than likely what happens is way before you actually die when you get really sick you already start waking up into your next life you just wake you just like go through a weird dreamlike state called the bardo where you freak the fuck out and then you're suddenly alive in another being completely oblivious to whatever your past incarnations were mm. and that's what we're in right now so you know i don't know this is a great time for people to start you know looking at that in one in, in preparing for that and as you learn to meditate and perform transcendental meditation more and more that actually unlocks that dna light code that's within you already the lessons that we are born with that are actually coded in amnesia that we can't remember that's what makes meditation so wonderful is it really unlocks those already learned lessons and everything and then you have this connected intuitive knowing and you don't really know where all this information is coming from well it's coming from past versions of you and your ancestors that are passing it along to you and it's writ within your dna it's beautiful it's really such a beautiful concept the idea that we walk around in this sort of wakeful dream state is talking about the images that we get in our head, our imagination is actually real in a sense, because what you mentally can think up here and hold on to it for long enough will eventually come to pass in your real life. That's what we have come, now come to call manifestation the, or the law of attraction. What you think about, you bring about. It's really important that you take control of your mind. Modern neurology says that you have 30 to 50,000 thoughts a day and the purpose of the meditation is to not stop thinking and is to not control all of those thoughts that's too much too much effort but the point is to direct your mind along the banks of a river okay you're taking your thoughts which is the water and you are directing it in a flow that you want to go like so you're thinking about only what you want to think you only accept the positivity and you reject all negativity things like that these are these are mind frames that you stay in and you you've trained them the same way you flex your muscles you have to weighted repetitious tasks over and over and over again that's why challenges that's why great men and great women are forged in fire okay it's temperance it's temperance it's important to note what duncan trussell there is talking about with genetic lessons being passed on with each generation just like deepak chopra talked about in the first clip Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Job, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse. Now Job is in the Old Testament, and uh, it's the oldest book in the world. There is no known book in the world as old as the book of Job. And yet Job asked a question that I'm sure disturbs many of you tonight. He asked a question that every great philosopher has wrestled with. He asked a question that every great thinker and intellectual at some time wrestles with. He asks the same question that one of the greatest scientists in this country asked me about three weeks ago. He said, science knows nothing about it, but he said, I'm disturbed about it and worried about it. Here is the question. If a man die, shall he live again? If a man die, shall he live again the problem of death and life or life and death haven't you ever thought about that you know what the bible says the bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die birth is a happy event death is a tragic event and we have tears you take the fifth chapter of Genesis and you'll see the list of all those men that lived to be old men. At the end of every life is death. Life is very brief. The Bible says it's a tale that is told. It's a weaver's shuttle. It's a flower that fades. It's like the grass that withers. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow expressed it once when he said, art is long and time is fleeting. And our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums of beating funeral marches to the grave and that's exactly where we're all headed it is appointed unto man once to die thou shalt die and not live now the great question is 
Are you ready to meet God? Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. There is something after death according to this book. Now again, I say I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove it to you. But this book teaches from Genesis to Revelation that this life is only a preparation room for eternity. There is another life. The Old Testament teaches it. The New Testament teaches it. Jesus taught it. The apostles taught it. If a man dies, shall he live again? That's the question Job asked. And the answer from the Bible is a resounding yes. There is a life after death. Cicero, the great Roman, said upon this subject, I entertain no more than conjecture. I've spent a great deal of my life searching for the answer. Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, in one of her columns a few years ago said, it's instinctive for man to believe in life after death, and it is. You never find a tribe anywhere in the world, you never find a culture, you never find a civilization anywhere in history that didn't believe in some form of life after death. And when the early forefathers and pilgrims came to this country, they thought they had found some tribes in New England that didn't believe, tribes of Indians that didn't believe in life after death, but they soon found when they communicated with them that they believed in the happy hunting ground. Yes, man instinctively, something down inside says there must be a future life. There must be something beyond this life. So even in the mighty words of Billy Graham, you can see that there is no corner of the earth that is without the contemplation of life after death. It is really that important of a subject. And not only must there be something after death, but so many cultures around the world have had their own intimate experiences with this life after death possibility and have taken the time through the last couple of thousand years to write down the books from the Tibetan Book of the Dead to the Egyptian Book of the Dead to uh, Taoism, okay, to even Western culture, Christianity. That's why I included that Billy Graham clip because I wanted to not only have an Eastern philosophy, but uh, the Western philosophy as well. I, that's I, I believe in total egalitarianism. So it's all information in love and light. So that's what we do here on Reality Decoded. So to do a quick recap, according to the Hindus, they talk about meditation being the preparation for death. That way, whenever you come to your deathbed or moment of going, you are not cursing your body regretting that you didn't do more in this lifetime and christianity talks about we are gifted with the result of death to be able to be born again to have the chance to ascend spiritually to what they call seeing god going to heaven um to what the tibetans and the hindus t talk about reaching nirvana or a state of consciousness that is like christ whatever your end goal is it is to not be reincarnated again but to learn from karma and to treat others with dignity and respect, to escape the wheel, to ascend to the next level, and then to be able to pretty much spiritually do what you want. So I hope you all gain some insight from this episode and to really learn to let go of the fears of, oh, we're dying. Well, it's not the only thing that's left. So I love you guys, and I hope to see you all on the next episode. Thanks.